global liquidity has been the main driver of world wealth. And you can see from that black line that there was a low point, a bottom recently, which happened to be in October of 2022. And we think that it's highly probable that this cycle will peak out sometime around late 2025. And that's, you know, that's how the liquidity cycle moves. This phase of the liquidity cycle, when you get the trough and you move up to mid-cycle, is normally the most rewarding for financial markets. It's when you want to be owning risk assets. Uh, the next phase is, as you move from the mid-cycle to the peak, becomes more difficult. Hello, everybody. Today, we have the pleasure to speak with the world's leading expert on financial market liquidity and central banks, Michael Howell, the founder and CEO of Cross Border Capital from London. The main focus of his work is analyzing liquidity trends and capital flows in order to translate that into investment decisions. Michael, welcome and thanks so much for your time. Pleasure to be here, Boston. Thank you for the invitation. Michael, before we dive in, would you be so kind and give our audience who may not know you yet a brief background about you? Let me let me try as best I can. Um, I've been in financial markets um, pretty much since the mid 1980s. So for uh, a long time, in fact, uh, I started off at Salomon Brothers, the uh, American investment bank. Um, Salomon Brothers was uh, uh, in those days, the dominant investment bank worldwide, it was pretty much the bond markets. Uh, all sovereign governments worldwide had to use Salomon Brothers as the main trading mechanism, if you like. And Salomon Brothers had global reach. It was uh, a very important player in the markets. And much of the research on finance, uh, the original research, some of the original research actually came out of Salomon Brothers Research Department, uh, which was then led by Marty Leibowitz and another gentleman called Henry Kaufman. And they provided a lot of the infrastructure that we're now used to, things like understanding duration, arbitraging the yield curve, uh, flow of funds analysis, uh, many of these aspects, duration matching, all these things came out of the Salomon Brothers uh, School. Use of futures, leveraging of futures, arbitrage in bond markets, um, et cetera. Many of the things we now know and love, or maybe even hate, uh, originated at that time. I then went to work after Salomon Brothers, I went to work for Bearings, the uh, British investment bank. Um, and uh, after Bearings uh, had its difficulties, as people will remember in 1996 uh, or 1995, I then left uh, to set up Cross Border Capital, which I've been doing for uh, over 20 years, 25 years. In the last couple of weeks, major stock market indices, gold, and Bitcoin have been breaking all time records. Why is that? And are you at all surprised? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is no great surprise. Um, what's driving it is money. Money moves markets. Um, asset prices are not formed in textbooks. They're formed in markets and markets are driven by money. And the flow of money that has emanated from central banks, uh, particularly over the last 15 months, has been actually significant. Uh, it's been sufficient to propel asset prices higher. And, you know, one wants really to dig into the reasons why central banks have been doing this. After all, they've been telling us that they're tightening when in the reality is the reverse. Yeah, exactly. With interest rates at pretty high levels and with all the talk about quantitative tightening, aren't we supposed to be going through the monetary restrictive times right now? I mean, where where is the disconnect? Well, I think the first thing to say is let's understand the monetary system or the financial system. And that is something that we need to rethink uh, because the world has changed a lot. And the world has changed in many ways because of the uh, of the appearance of China as a major uh, economic and financial force in the world. And what that's done is it's changed in many cases the polarity of the financial system. But to be more specific, the burden that the West faces is a debt burden. And what has happened, particularly in the last 25 years, is that the debt that the West has taken on has grown enormously. So financial markets today act no longer as new capital financing vehicles for capital spending or for economic growth. 
uh, they're basically debt refinancing vehicles. And that's really a very important difference. So let me try and articulate that in terms of uh, to spell out that that difference. Today, what you have is something like three hundred and fifty trillion dollars of debt worldwide. Uh, debt, unlike equity, needs to be refinanced. And with an average maturity of about five years on that debt, that means by simple math that $70 trillion of debt has to be rolled over each year. And to roll over debt, you need liquidity in markets and you need balance sheet capacity. And that's why liquidity is a very important thing to watch. If you don't get that facility, you get refinancing crises. And if you look back over the last two to three decades, every financial crisis has been a refinancing crisis in some form. Okay, 2008 being a classic example, but even more recently in 2019 in America with the repo crisis, that was another refinancing uh, problem. Now, to give a specific example, which will probably crystallize this, think about a home mortgage. Most people have home mortgages. Those home mortgages have a duration or maturity, and let's say that's 25 years. So if you can't repay your mortgage after 25 years, you've got to roll it over. If you don't roll the mortgage over, you're homeless. OK, that focuses the mind. It's not the interest rate that matters after 25 years. It's the ability to roll the mortgage. And the same applies to corporate debt. If a corporation can't roll its debt, then what's going to happen is going to default. <clears throat> so liquidity, debt rollovers are really important. And the world financial system has become a refinancing system, not a new financing system. In a new financing world, interest rates are important because it's governing the cost of capital. In a refinancing world, the volume of liquidity is important. And that's the basic distinction. We're in a world now where liquidity really matters. When we talked last in October of 21, you said that it would be for the best if the central banks kept raising interest rates while refraining from quantitative tightening in order to avoid stifling the refinancing debt. Mm -hmm. Is this what almost actually happened? Well, I think that that's more or less the case, yes. Uh, they've certainly kept interest rates at high levels, but there is, an, there is a, let's say, um, a desire among policymakers, and you can hear that from the Federal Reserve itself, uh, with Jay Powell's statements that were at peak interest rates and how rates will likely come down this year. There's a, there's a desire for them to cut rates. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a sensible thing to do. First of all, because you've got a big debt problem, and one of the things you don't want to do is to add to that debt burden. You want to disincentivize people holding debt. So you want to keep interest rates at a high level. Um, and secondly, the U.S. economy looks like it's actually accelerating, not decelerating. So the need to cut interest rates probably isn't there. And what's more, you can see emerging and nagging inflation problems out there. So I think all in all, they ought to keep to the remit that or keep to the policy they're currently enacting, which is basically creating liquidity and keeping interest rates high. If we take uh, the Fed, for example, as the most important central bank player globally, we have relatively high interest rates right now. The balance sheet is sort of shrinking. Where is the liquidity coming from then? Well, it's really coming in two, in two major directions. <clears throat> First of all, if you look at the central bank and look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, the balance sheet is not... Um, the ultimate source of liquidity. The balance sheet is a statistic that um, policymakers want us to look at, but the balance sheet is not necessarily liquidity creating. What you've got to look at is each line item on the balance sheet to see whether it provides liquidity or not. So for example, to take an absurd example, on the balance sheet, the Federal Reserve balance sheet, there's an, there's an item which values the uh, property and real estate of the Federal Reserve, okay? Well, that clearly isn't liquidity creating, right? Um, so what you've got to look at is different line items. And basically what you can do is you can look at uh, open market operations, which is the buying and selling of treasuries in the system. So what they're doing now is they're letting treasuries roll off the balance sheet, which is QT. So that's a negative. But then on top of that, you've got banking support measures, the recently uh, terminating uh, bank term funding program, it will still even be in place for a year, but you can't, people can no longer access new lending. Uh, that's been there. Discount window borrowing, 
That's another source of liquidity. And then on the other side, there are two offsets which, are, which can uh, create uh, or destroy liquidity. One is called the reverse repo account, and the other is called the treasury general account. Now, those are slightly wonkish concepts, but let me just say that the big inflow of liquidity in the last 15 months has largely come because the reverse repo program on the Fed's balance sheet has dropped dramatically. And that was a pool of money that was taken out of the money markets. So it was, a, it was a, if you like, it was taken uh, out of the monetary system and sat on the Fed balance sheet. And that's now diminishing and being pushed back into money markets. And that's fallen from something like 2.7, 2.8 trillion at the peak to something like about 500 uh, billion now. So there's been, you know, close to $2 trillion pushed back into US money markets because of that rundown of the account. So even though the Fed balance sheet has fallen by one and a half trillion, there's been a net injection into US money markets of about five to 600 billion. What about ECB? The ECB is a bit more complicated. Um, but broadly speaking, the ECB is keeping a more uh, a, a more a tighter monetary stance. But nonetheless, the ECB itself is beginning to move. And our indexes of liquidity creation by the ECB have tripled in the last 12 months, for example. I mean, they got down to very low levels, one would have to say, and they're looking at indexes. So the index has gone from maybe an index of 10 out of 100, 0 to 100, 10 to about 30. But that's still a meaningful change. And it will go up higher because I would suspect the ECB will be easing uh, pretty aggressively from the middle of the year. They have a lot more reason to ease because the European economy is in much, much worse shape than the American economy. Can you unpack a bit how do you at cross-border capital measure liquidity? Yeah, well, it's uh, a comprehensive way of doing it because we're covering 90 countries worldwide. Um, some of those are less important than others, including the most important really are the US Federal Reserve, uh, the People's Bank of China, uh, the ECB, of course, uh, and the Bank of Japan. So we look very closely at those major central banks as well. But what we're really looking at is, if you like, three major elements. We're looking at what the central banks are creating in total in terms of their liquidity injections. We're also looking at what the private sector creates. And that is a question of looking in detail, not just to conventional banking, but also looking at uh, shadow banking, uh, understanding wholesale markets and repo markets. And then thirdly, we're looking at cross-border flows into economies. And cross-border flows can be a very big uh, source of liquidity, particularly for smaller economies. And uh, what do you mean by shadow banking? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a $64,000 question uh, <laughs> because it's, um, uh, <laughs> it's a grey area of banks that are really providing credit, but are generally outside the normal uh, remit of the regulators. So they're sort of in that gray zone of uh, are they a bank or are they not? And generally, I mean, there are there are many different definitions, but you could say that uh, shadow banks are creating credit, but they're basically getting their funding from capital markets. So they may they may raise security. They may they may issue securities. They may issue repos. They're getting uh, funding from the markets and then they're lending on again that uh, that money to other entities. I mean, a good example, a classic example would be a mortgage bank. I mean, that's a shadow bank in a sense. Um, uh, but these things have now proliferated to many, many different areas. So you can look at things like for um, what's called uh, forex swaps. So in other words, you've got for you've got a foreign ex you've got a uh, a foreign exchange deposit. You've got dollars, uh, or, or maybe a better example, you've got yen, and you can swap those yen into dollars, and you can then use that dollar that dollar borrowing to go and do whatever you want. So there's lots of different mechanisms to do that. Uh, there's a lot of um, collateralized borrowing. So in other words, if you've got uh, another example would be, and this is a, a much bigger example, if I hold a treasury bond, uh, an American treasury bond, that's actually a very liquid asset. So I can borrow against that. And you know the vast majority of borrowing in the world economy now is collateral based. In other words, that following the um, the 2008 financial crisis, credit providers demand 
more security for borrowers. And so, uh, particularly in the financial sector, <clears throat> many borrowers will post collateral in the form of treasury bonds <clears throat> or high quality corporate debt um, to borrow against. And they borrow against that collateral uh, with a haircut, what's called a haircut. Now that haircut can be uh, 5%, 10%, whatever the thing, whatever the credit provider will decide. But that haircut is very important in understanding the credit mechanism because it's very sensitive to volatility in markets. So if you get a lot of volatility in the bond markets, the credit providers will stick up the haircuts and say, well, you're, we're not going to lend to you now with a 2% haircut on the collateral. We're going to drop that to 4%. Now, that means that your ability to leverage suddenly crashes down. And these things can be very, very important in understanding how liquidity mechanisms work. So it's become more complicated. It's not simply a question of looking at bank lending, but the fact is that it's important. Just because something's difficult to do doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't be doing it. Of course. So you then aggregate all these data and include it in your uh, global liquidity index, right? Correct. Correct. And I'll show you, I can uh, share a screen and yes, I can please. show you um, uh, that if you can see that chart. This is our global liquidity index, which is basically illustrating over time how the flow of money in the world economy works. Now, this is an index of all that data. That data is in total now uh, a figure of about $170 trillion. So it's something like one and two thirds or one and a half times the size of the world economy. Um, and it's a fast moving, it, it represents fast moving flows of money. This is a measure of the momentum in that uh, liquidity pool, how it's shifting around. The black line is the actual data and you can see from that black line that there was a low point, a bottom recently, which happened to be in October of 2022. And we think that that black line is climbing and it's basically shadowing the red dotted line. The red dotted line is a sine wave that we've added to that. That sine wave is uh, something that we first drew. It hasn't changed since this point. But we first drew in uh, about 20 years ago in year 2000. Uh, we fitted that sine wave to the then existing data. And we thought it was seeing a fairly regular cycle. And we've basically extrapolated it ever since. And you know what you can see is particularly in the recent cycle, it's absolutely matched that pattern exactly. And that would allow us to infer that it's highly probable that this cycle will peak out sometime around late 2025. And that's, you know, that's how the liquidity cycle moves. This phase of the liquidity cycle, when you get the trough and you move up to mid-cycle, is normally the most rewarding for financial markets. It's when you want to be owning risk assets. Uh, the next phase is, as you move from the mid-cycle to the peak, becomes more difficult. Uh, if you look at the record of Wall Street, Wall Street uh, tends to see about two-thirds of its gains uh, in the first phase of the cycle. And then the next phase from maybe the mid cycle through to the peak gives you about a third of those gains. Now to give you another impression of how this is moving, I'll try and find another slide. Um, sorry, I've got to go, I've got to try and uh, think about this. This this slide is basically looking at uh, how that cycle works. And it's showing the liquidity cycle in orange, the notional liquidity cycle, and then it's looking at how the economic cycle uh, follows that by about 15 months or so. And on that chart, we've annotated where you would expect to see changes in the yield curve, the slope of the yield curve. And then we have regimes that we think of in terms of turbulence, rebound, calm, speculation. And to move on in this sequence, this is the distribution of markets worldwide. So the red area is what we call turbulence. Turbulence, as the name suggests, is a very difficult area for investors. Uh, it's when you tend to lose money. Uh, the green areas are more positive. That's indicating uh, where you get either what we call a rebound area where gains are very strong or a calm area where you get, uh, admittedly, uh, gains are maybe less, but the risk is a lot less in the calm area. 
and then speculation, which is uh, the sort of blow off phase at the at the end of the cycle. And what you can see is that the majority, this is the percentage of markets worldwide out of the 90 we look at, uh, what which one is in each particular phase. And what we are where we are now is that two thirds of world markets are in that sort of green zone of either rebound or calm. But if you go back to the summer of 2022, you can see there that uh, it was a very different question. Most markets were in turbulence. Now, what caused that inflection point? What caused that inflection point was the British guilt crisis in September of 22, which was the wake up call to central bankers worldwide. Now, I can try and illustrate if I can find the slide, but I'm just going to have to wing through this presentation uh, and see if I can find it here. If you look at this chart, this is looking at a heat map of what central banks have been doing. On the north south axis, you will see there a list of countries uh, which are split by regions. And at the top, the very top line is the world. Um, the colours refer to whether a central bank is tightening liquidity or easing liquidity. Green is easing, red is tightening. Um, as those colour hues change from green to red, so the system is becoming tighter. The maximum tightness was around the middle of 2022, coinciding with that previous chart. And you can see now that we're moving much more into the green zones. And that's how asset allocation is basically evolving over time. Now, one other further heads up, which I'm going to uh, show, is about uh, asset markets and about um, how the world economy responds to this. This chart is showing the growth rate of global liquidity in orange. So this is a little bit different to the cycle I just showed, but this is the straight growth rate, year on year change of global liquidity. And the black line is the performance of all forms of wealth in the world economy. <clears throat> now, what we mean by that is all bond market performance, all stock market performances, all liquid asset returns, all um, precious metal returns, uh, all real estate, residential real estate returns. And that is put into a portfolio. That portfolio represents an amount of wealth of about 350 to $400 trillion worldwide. And the returns on that portfolio are shown as that black line. And what this is basically saying is for the most part, uh, through that period from the last 25 years, global liquidity has been the main driver of world wealth. So understanding liquidity movements is absolutely critical. This is how we think of asset allocation. And I refer you back to the earlier chart where I was talking about regimes. We think of four regimes, which are designated at the top of those two columns. We think of rebound, calm, speculation, and turbulence as four regimes to think of. Markets move through those four investment regimes sequentially. We are coming to the end of the rebound phase now, moving towards calm. If you look at the traffic lights uh, on the left, that shows asset classes. And if you look at industry groups on the right, uh, that's showing which sectors of the stock market you should be investing in. We are we have been in rebound for 15 months or so. And if you look down the column uh, for rebound on both the left and the right hand sides, you will see that those are the asset classes that normally should perform. So this is a historic analysis that says, based on our experience, what will you expect to perform in each zone? And in rebound, you'd expect equity markets and credits to be major performers and commodities to be underperformers and bond duration, in other words, long dated debt to be an unattractive proposition. You'd also expect from the industry groups outperformance from cyclicals, from technology stocks, uh, mixed performance from financials and underperformance from energy and defensives. And I would venture that that, dis that distribution has been exactly what has happened over the last 15 months. So my conclusion is, is this is a very, very normal investment cycle, despite what economists keep telling us. But sadly, economists are not always right uh, about, uh, about the future. Uh, we're moving into calm now. 
And if we're correct, what you should begin to see is further outperformance from equities, uh, the beginnings of outperformance from commodity markets, uh, continued performance from technology, the pickup in performance from financials, and the beginnings of outperformance from energy stocks. And that is that would again reinforce the idea it's a normal cycle. And that's what we think we're getting. Now, I'm going to show you one last chart, then I'll uh, revert back. This is um, an index which is showing two indexes, which is showing the performance of the American economy. And these are two indicators that I like to look at because I think they're very prescient and they've got an extremely good track record, but they're not the normal indicators to look at. One of those is uh, the graph that's shown in orange, which is looking at the uh, Institute of Supply Management uh, survey, the ISM, orders minus inventories. So it's not the headline ISM, but it's the orders question less inventories. Uh, and that's showing that's a very sensitive guide to the economy. And that is definitely uh, picking up. So it's saying the orders are increasing uh, and inventories are being run down. So <clears throat> that's a positive sign. And the other is the six month change in the conference board leading indicator of the American economy. And that also is inflected. Those two factors are reinforcing the picture and is telling us that the world economy is beginning to turn around. So let me revert back to you now. And um, that's some slides to give a flavor of what we do. Mm -hmm. And how favorable um, are the real economy and political circumstances for present liquidity conditions to continue? Well, uh, let me let me answer that uh, th this way. Um, about a week or so ago in America, Barron's, the financial journal, had a headline which said, uh, bull market starting, economy looking strong. Now, that is exactly the warning to get out of markets, if that's correct. OK, <laughs> you do not want to invest when the economy is strong. Strong economies do not have strong financial markets. And that is a that that statement that they made that the economy is picking up and you want to buy uh, financial assets is completely the wrong investment advice. The best time to buy financial assets, particularly equities, is when you've got a sluggish economy that policymakers are trying to stimulate. That's when you make most money. You lose most money when the economic environment goes from looking really good to just good, just plain good. So excellent to plain good. That's when you lose your most money. And that's the stage we've got to be very wary of. So to say that the economy is accelerating and it's time to invest is a completely wrong statement. So what we should be actually looking forward to is more sluggish economic news, which is why maybe looking outside of America now into Europe or into Asia are the best places to put, be putting money. Mm -hmm. Because the UK and Germany are still in recession. Correct. And so forth. Correct. And, you know, the other part of your question, which is what about geopolitics? I think the question to ask is, uh, what sort of geopolitics are we really thinking of? Because most of the <clears throat> factors or most of the things that we can think of, which is, you know, further tensions with China, um, Russia may be taking uh, uh, maybe uh, a, a more aggressive line with Ukraine, whatever it may be. All those are factors that would actually, I would think, encourage central bankers and policymakers to ease further, not tighten. So those things may paradoxically be positive news. The US election is another factor which one's got to factor in here. And I think that one of the big issues in financial markets for everybody to contemplate and to ponder is what's happening to the price of gold. Now, gold has been a long term um, investment haven, if you like for many people that are nervous about geopolitics or concerned about inflation. But the gold price tends to move oppositely to interest rates and particularly real interest rates. In other words, if real interest rates go up, the gold price normally comes down because the cost of carry is high. Now, what you've been seeing for the last year or so is that real interest rates have gone up in America, but the gold price has also gone up. So gold is disconnected from real interest rates. And that's a very important fact. Uh, many economists are saying that gold is overvalued because real interest rates are high and real interest rates will stay high. 
But what I would say is don't listen to the economists, listen to the market. The market is telling us something very different here. And what the market is getting concerned about is monetary inflation. And monetary inflation is something we've all got to be very thoughtful about as asset allocators and being concerned about our assets because monetary inflation is restarting. And by monetary inflation, I mean the deliberate devaluation of paper monies by governments. Uh, the COVID response was the first episode that we saw policymakers decide that rather than raising taxes to fund spending, they'd print money or issue debt. OK, and so it has gone on. The American economy is now running with a budget deficit year after year after year of seven to eight percent, perhaps more. If we'd have said that 20 years ago, people would have been, uh, you know, staggered. They would have, it was a jaw dropping statement. Stanley Druckermiller, the legendary U.S. investor in uh, a YouTube broadcast about three or four months ago, uh, made a statement about the U.S. finances, the funding of the U.S. government and the decision they'd made to issue a lot of Treasury bills, short term financing. And he said the statistics that are coming out of the U.S. Treasury are the numbers you expect from Latin America, not the United States. Uh, and But this is a reality. If you look at latest money supply figures in America, and I'm not a great devotee of money supply because I think it's an archaic statistic. But, but I still look at it. If you look at money supply statistics, money supply in America is beginning to accelerate again, which people are saying is, you know, positive news for the economy. And sure, it probably is. But if you delve into those numbers, what you find is that it's increasing not because private lending is increasing. It's because funding of the government is increasing. So what's happening already is you're getting monetization. And you asked me earlier on who is doing this. Uh, who is behind this liquidity increase. It's partly the central banks printing money, but it's also a direct monetization of uh, government debt uh, through the banking systems. And if you're selling treasury bills or short dated government debt to credit providers, that is monetization. And, you know, the celebrated economist, the monetarist Milton Friedman, will be turning in his grave looking at these numbers now or what the American administration is doing. They are deliberately monetizing. If that is the case, what about the dollar? The dollar will look shaky in that environment. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that you've got to expect a big collapse in the dollar against the euro or against the yen or whatever. I don't think that's going to happen because I think these other governments are going to do exactly the same thing. So if they see the dollar weakening, they're going to go with it. So the first sign of a weaker dollar, uh, you will see the ECB easing aggressively, in my view, and I would expect there to be a series of uh, pronounced interest rate cuts and balance sheet expansion in the second half of the year, because they will not want the euro to go up. Far from it, in fact. Uh, the European economy couldn't stand that. The Japanese yen, I've long been uh, uh, of the view that the yen is not a strong currency anymore. Uh, it has been deliberately held at low levels, and it continues despite the, the it's been the big consensus trade this year for people to go long yen, but it's not been my view. I think the yen remains weak. But if the dollar does devalue, it devalues against gold and against Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies. And that is the thing to, to be very, very alert to. Now, I, I said I was going to uh, come out and not do these slides anymore, but I'm going to try and show uh, one more because I think it's I think it's important. Yeah, uh, sure. Allow no, me no to problem. go back into this. Process. Absolutely. I would show you one chart uh, if I can get this to work. Um, and uh, well, maybe I'm going to I'm going to cheat and show you two, two or three charts. This is the background for U.S. debt. And the orange line here is looking at the debt GDP ratio of America. So it goes from around about 110, 120 percent right now. This is public debt <clears throat> to an estimated near 250 percent by 2050. Those numbers are not our numbers. They're numbers that come from the Congressional Budget Office, which is a bipartisan, in other words, neutral uh, body in America, which assesses the U.S. fiscal situation. So even on their views, which are likely to be conservative, you're looking at a skyrocketing increase in the debt GDP ratio. Britain saw a similar increase in debt in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. Uh, which was really a legacy of two world wars. And you can see the red dotted line there. Yep. Legacy of that period 
was that the British economy was crushed in the uh, following decades. It could not cope with such high levels of debt. One of the things that you hear economists saying is that debt levels of 250% are unsustainable. They're not unsustainable, but they come with costs. They come with costs of slow growth and basically economic sickness. And you don't want to be in that situation. The public sector, the state, uh, becomes, if you like, a, a millstone around the economies. And that's the problem America has got to face. But nonetheless, what we've got is a challenge of funding. And if you look at, uh, I'm going to show you this chart. This is the Congressional Budget Office projections of the US deficit um, over each year to 2034. The red area is the primary deficit and the orange are interest payments. And you can see that that rolls on at around 7 to 8%, maybe even getting towards 9% of GDP by the end. These are really worrying data points to, to, to look at. They're coming because of this. And this is showing the rise in mandatory spending in America because of aging demographics uh, through um, um, Social Security payments or Medicare payments. Now, we know that the U.S. welfare system is not as generous as in Europe, and therefore Europe has an even bigger problem to face here uh, in terms of aging populations. This mandatory spending has to be paid for or funded, and it's growing very significantly. And what we're facing is two wars, if you like. And the problem is that wartime finance means monetization. Those two wars are against China, albeit a Cold War, and against demographics, which is uh, on the domestic front. And policymakers need to fight those two battles. What does it mean? Uh, it basically means that you've got, uh, which I'm going to come to here, long-term monetary inflation. And the black line here is showing our global liquidity index, sorry, our global liquidity measure on the right scale, which is moving up from the current 170 trillion to uh, over 200 trillion by 2025. That's the black line. Look where it's come from uh, over time. You'll see these big increases in liquidity. This is the rise of global liquidity, which has really colored the performance of financial markets uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so. The orange line is a hybrid, a simple market cap weighted average between cryptocurrencies, uh, predominantly Bitcoin and gold. So those are your monetary inflation hedges. And the dotted line is US consumer prices. So global liquidity has dramatically outperformed inflation, uh, but so have monetary inflation hedges. And the point that we keep coming back to time and time again, which is a critical point, is that gold and Bitcoin are monetary inflation hedges, not high street inflation hedges. And that's a very important distinction to draw. High street inflation is a cocktail or a hybrid between monetary inflation, the devaluation of your paper money and cost pressures. And those costs can be inflation or deflation. If China comes and dumps goods cheaply, in the West, therefore you get cost deflation and the monetary uh, inflation doesn't come through into the high street. That's one of the things that we saw in the last 10, 15 years. Very cheap Chinese products meant that high street inflation was, uh, was suppressed, even though there was monetary inflation. What you're getting now is probably not that positive effect from cost deflation. What you're getting is a monetary inflation combined with a cost inflation. And that's why inflation in the high street is going to be higher in the future than it was in the last two decades. And you can see here what you want uh, to do is to buy gold and to buy Bitcoin as monetary inflation hedges if we are correct. And that's what the gold market may now be sniffing out. And that's what Bitcoin may be sniffing out. So all those economists or uh, you know, advisors say, don't buy cryptocurrency and don't buy, uh, don't buy, don't buy gold or don't buy Bitcoin. Uh, I think they're completely wrong. So let me switch back to your. So actually, the expansionary fiscal policies are kind of a guarantee that the liquidity conditions are only going up in the future. So we have to protect our purchasing power through investment in gold, Bitcoin, various long term financial yes, not, assets. Not bonds. Equities, good quality equities will do that. 
providing inflation is not too high. Uh, res prime residential real estate will do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, bonds will not. But what governments will try and do is they're clearly trying to change the rules as far as they can and benefit themselves. So what they're trying to do is to get banks to hold more bonds. <clears throat> if you think back to what happened, uh, I mean, take America as a good example, but it's true in every country, is that during wartime, banks hold lots of bonds, lots of treasury bonds. Um, I think I'm correct in saying is that World War II, the banking system, 50% of the banking system's assets were in government bonds. Uh, what are they now? They're probably under 10%. Um, but the government will want, the US government will want banks to increase their bond holdings. And that's the debate we've currently got going on. That's what that's what you hear, you're hearing from the Federal Reserve. They want the banks to, they're either going to say, we're going to change the rules so they've got to have more safe assets, so-called safe assets, but we know they're not really safe assets. Uh, they're, they're risky assets. Uh, they've got to have more safe assets. Pension funds have got to be funded directly, so they've got to have more government bonds. Uh, this is just convenience from their point of view. But you don't want to be in those assets because it's what is called financial repression. You will lose money in real terms over the over the medium term. Very good example, uh, or maybe a bad example in terms of its historical uh, meaning. But uh, think back to the German hyperinflation in the early 1920s. And in the German hyperinflation, you had two classes, the young and the old. The older generations held bonds. That was their tradition. They funded the German government because bonds were rock solid, particularly in, uh, in the German psyche. Um, unfortunately, they, their wealth was just destroyed in the hyperinflation. The younger generations didn't own bonds. They put their money in the stock market. The German stock market rocketed in nominal terms and was a very, very good inflation hedge. So what you saw in Germany in the 1920s was a huge wealth redistribution from the older generations to the younger generations in that monetary inflation. Now, if you roll on um, 100 years, what you've got is a monetary inflation going on, um, not a hyperinflation, I, I venture, but a monetary inflation, a, a smaller degree, but you're getting the same feature. And the younger generations are saying, well, look, we want to protect our wealth. We're putting it into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And the older generations are saying, you're just crazy. These are not safe assets. Uh, it's all going to end in tears. But they're keeping their money in government bonds. And that's where you're losing money, rather like Germany in the 1920s. OK, so the road for the long term investor is pretty clear. What about a uh, shorter term? Could consumer price inflation surprise with a comeback given current financial conditions in, in 2024? Well, I don't think it's necessarily a surprise. I think that it's what you would expect uh, in an environment where you've basically got uh, fiscal policy that is very generous. In America, you've got um, um, an 8% an budget deficit, and that 8% budget deficit is... Uh, underpinning a very strong economy, plus the fact the Federal Reserve is not tightening, as I've argued, uh, they're, ad they're adding liquidity to the system. So you're on two fronts, you've got an easy monetary and an easy fiscal policy. So it's little surprise the US economy is rebounding and why inflation is sticky. I think that's that's the fact. But then you've got to go back and look at the response in general of the West to the COVID crisis compared to what happened in China. And I think if you if you take that perspective, you'll see what's happening in the world economy right now. Because basically what we what we got uh, out of um, COVID was stagflation. The thing was that the stag was in the east, the stagnation, and the flation, the inflation was in the west. And the reason for that was what happened during COVID was that after that supply shock from the COVID emergency, the West met that with a demand boost. OK, so they increased spending, government spending and whatever. They gave transport payments and that created inflation simple supply and demand analysis tells you you're going to create inflation in that in that world and exactly that's what happened and in china what they did for partly uh yeah for part, uh, partly for other reasons is that when the covid shock hit they tightened policy so as they tighten policy you don't get inflation you get deflation and you get a big drop in output and that's exactly what happened in the case of china so what you've got now in the west is that you've got the su supply responses coming back probably in the West and the East. In Asia, you're going to get a big output response, okay? 
Uh, and that's what we're beginning to see, I would venture. Look at Asia-Pacific trade volumes, they're really picking up. Look at the commodity prices, they're beginning to turn. The Chinese stock market is now beginning to get a bit, is beginning to get bottom out. And I think that China and China and Asia are in for a period of some much better growth. And in the West, what we're seeing is this embedded inflation background. So that's the problem that we've we've got to tackle. But it was really coming back to how policymakers reacted to uh, the COVID emergency initially. So, you know, one of the things, if so if this is the correct analysis, commodity markets are really where you've got to start looking in the next few months. Uh, as regards financial as assets, for on a short-term view, I'm not very positive because I think there could be an accident in Q2, a technical accident in the US, uh, largely because um, the economy has been so strong that tax payments will be a lot more buoyant than people think. And that will be money that will come out of bank accounts into the Treasury, and the Treasury may not be able to spend it fast enough. And that will cause a wobble, a short term wobble in liquidity in US money markets around April, May time. Now, that's a, a very, very short term concern, but that would mean there could be a buying opportunity ahead. Exactly. And uh, if I if I recapitulate a bit, over the next year or year and a half, you see major stock markets continue to grow, right? Well, I think I do, but I would I would mm -hmm. I would caveat that by saying that that you know we've seen big gains to the right sectors, right? Yeah, you've you've got to rotate, and I think the rotate. I mean, I would be rotating now quite aggressively into other areas. And as I as I suggested, you, you want mining commodity areas. You probably want to start shifting assets towards Europe and towards Asia. Uh, maybe emerging markets are, are worth looking at in this environment because they're very commodity sensitive. And maybe taking some money out of the US uh, because it's already had a very good run. Uh, but, you know, um, they're not saying the US market won't go up. Uh, but I think that there, there are clearly some questions to ask after a market has, you know, the, as I maybe said, at the beginning, at this stage of the cycle, you'd expect uh, Wall Street to have already given two thirds of its ultimate gains for this bull market. That's the normal timeline. So, you know, those people like Barron's are saying, well, the bull market starts now. Well, uh, hey, I'm sorry, you missed most of it. Yeah. And what is your outlook on gold and Bitcoin over the next year, year and a half? Higher for both. Higher for both. What about bonds? Stay away. Well, I think the yields in the US are going to get to at least five and a quarter percent, uh, maybe maybe more. I'd stay away. I mean, if you want the front end, I mean, look, no, no one can deny the fact that if you're investing in short term bonds, very short term bonds, you're getting five and a quarter percent. That's not a bad carry. Uh, I mean, I'll come quietly on that. That's that's OK. But I, from a long term perspective, you don't want to own bond duration. Are there any major risks that can derail your predictions in the next year or two? Plenty. I don't know what they are, though. <laughs> um, what, but, could, what could be? Well, I think the US election is a major uncertainty. And I think that, um, you know, that, that could clearly fall either way. And we don't know really what the outcome will be in terms of, of the dollar. Um, so I think that that's, that's, that would be, to my mind, the major risk. I think that, um, you know, as regards... Other, you know, what are what are the other risks as far as we know? Uh, the other risks, you know, could be, you know, a worsening of the Ukraine Russia war. Uh, but I would think that that would be met with more liquidity rather than less. In other words, that there'd have to be more money printing in that environment. Um, it could be that there's some tension in China, but again, I don't think the Chinese are particularly interested in creating, uh, you know, an, an, another sort of uh, another another bout of tension. Uh, with America, they want to get on with it and get their, their, they're much more, I think, focused on getting their economy revived. So I would suggest that's probably a, a more limited uh, risk. And lastly, where can our audience continue to follow you? Well, the easiest way for, um, uh, for sort of retail high net worth individuals is through Substack, which you're more probably familiar with. We have a, a Substack site called Capital Wars. Capital Wars is the title of a book that I wrote about five years ago about global liquidity. But the uh, the Substack uh, gives our views. We write two, three, uh, at least pieces a week on what's going on in markets, giving data and whatever. Uh, there is, for those that just want a teaser, 
there is uh, Twitter, where the handle is at cross border cap. And for institutional investors uh, who want to get data, quant funds, or whatever it may be, or uh, narrative reports, our website is crossbordercapital.com. Michael Howell, thanks so much again for the great talk and for your time. And I hope to talk to you soon again. Great, Boschan. Thank you for the invitation. Enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.